We all have both a fascination with the future and a fear of it. Just suppose that I had a unique gift of the word of knowledge and could give each of you the date of your death. How many of you would come and ask me, would you want to know the date of your death or not? I mean, you could then celebrate your birthday every year and your death day every year. Wouldn't that be fun? <laughs> we have this fascination to know the future, and yet part of it doesn't want to know the future. We're happy with the present. There are three, broadly speaking, three ways to find out about the future. There's the way of superstition, which is the occult way of finding out the future. And that's anything from reading the lines on your hand to tea leaves in a teacup, to tarot cards, to all kinds of ways, your horoscope. Do you know that six out of 10 men and seven out of 10 women in America read their horoscope every day? That's why they're always in newspapers and magazines, what the stars tell you about the future. All those superstitious ways, those occult ways, are only ever at the most 5% correct. Or as I prefer to put it, 95% wrong. So why people waste their time and money on such things, I don't know. When I was in Paris, I walked down the Champs Elysees, the great uh, avenue from the Arc de Triomphe, and I saw a huge queue waiting outside a shop. And I asked my friend with me, what, what are they queuing for? What, what's, what are they selling in there? He says, they sell you your fortune for the next month at approximately $20 a time. And people were lining the street to get their forecast for the next month. It was pathetic, but somebody was making good money out of it. The second way to foretell the future is the way of science. Superstition is one way, science is the next. I was in a university not long ago and there was a student operating a computer and I said, what are you working out? He said, I'm working out the date of the end of the world. Oh, I said, that's interesting. How did you, how did you do that? Well, he said, I feed all the relevant data from the present into the computer, population growth, food reserves, fuel reserves, all the factors I can feed in and then I asked the commuter, when will the big crunch come when it will be impossible for many people to live? And I said, have you got a date yet? He said, yes. I said, what is it? He said, 2040. He said, by that time, so many trends will have crossed and the human race will be in real peril. I said, that's very interesting because the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in uh, America has come up with the same date from their computers. Now, of course, nobody knows what different trends will come in, whether great disasters that reduce the population or whether new discoveries of fuel or sources of energy, but on present trends, that's the date that people are giving, 2040. I don't need to worry about that, <laughs> but some of you do. <laughs> but science, the science of futurology, as it's called, and now there are professors of futurology trying to predict the future, there are think tanks trying to predict the future, but science has never been more than 25% right about the future. And I say 75% wrong. 
There is a third way to find out about the future, and that's scripture. You can go for superstition, and the majority of people do. You can go for science, 5%, 25%. When you tend to the Bible, it's been 100% accurate about the future. And I gave you the statistics the other day, 735 separate predictions about the future in your Bible. 24% of the verses in the Bible have a prediction in them. Why do people go to superstition or even science when they could have such an accurate prediction about the future? One of those 735 predictions is actually mentioned in the Old and New Testament over 300 times. And that prediction is Jesus is coming back. That's the most important prediction in the Bible when we're thinking about the future. And so far, as I told you, 81% of the predictions of the Bible have come true in detail, in practicality, literally. And therefore, I believe the other 19%, just under 20%, will come true in the future. And the heart of those future predictions focuses on the return of our Lord Jesus Christ to planet Earth. So I'm going to talk to you this morning in the first session about that return of Jesus to planet Earth. And then since the Apostles' Creed, on which we're basing these talks, goes on to speak about his judgment in the second talk this morning, I want to t talk about that great day when Jesus will judge the human race. First of all, then he's coming back. And there are many simple questions that we need to ask about that. One, who's coming back? And the answer is the same Jesus who left 2,000 years ago. In fact, the angel at the ascension told the disciples, this same Jesus will come back. There'll be no difference. He'll be exactly the same as the Jesus who left. Therefore, he's coming back in his body, in his resurrection body, not his old one. And he's coming back as himself. And we shall see him exactly the same as the disciples who said goodbye to him. This same Jesus, be in no doubt, he will be just the same. In fact, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. But it's the same Jesus the disciples knew and said farewell to on the Mount of Olives who's coming back. That answers the question, where will he come back? He's not coming back to any of the political capitals of the world. He's not coming back to Washington, D.C. He's not coming back to London. He's not coming back to Moscow. He's not coming back to any of the great political capitals of the nations. Nor is he coming back to any of the spiritual capitals of the world, whether Geneva or Canterbury or Rome or any of the spiritual capitals we know he's coming back to Jerusalem. That makes Jerusalem very, very important. I go to Jerusalem for three reasons, or to Israel. I first went in 1961 purely to study the past of Israel, to see where the Bible happened, to take pictures, to take home, uh, associated with the events in the Bible. I went purely for the past. And I felt some of the sites were a bit spoiled by people in the present, especially people selling picture postcards. I regarded the people now in Israel as a bit of a nuisance. I was simply wanting to go to an open-air museum. 
and study the past. Then in 1967, when I went out right at the end of the Six Day War and was up on the Golan Heights riding in an army jeep with a, uh, an Israeli army major, I began to get interested in Israel present. And for the next few years, I went out to Israel to study the present and the amazing thing that has happened in the Middle East, turning a barren land into the most fertile land you could imagine. And then, some years ago, I began to go for a very different reason. I began to go for the future. And now when I go to Israel, I go once a year at the Feast of Tabernacles to join thousands of other Christians from 120 countries and go to share with them the future of Israel. It's amazing to be able to visit places where events are going to take place. So I don't go for the past now. I don't take a camera with me now. I don't go for the present either to study modern Israel. I go for the future. I go to sites like Armageddon for something big is going to happen there. And Jerusalem itself, the city of the great king, Jesus called it. And that's where he's coming back. And so I go for the future now. So we know where Jesus is returning to us, same place and the same Jesus. And thirdly, we know how he's coming back because it's all there in the first book of Acts. This same Jesus coming to the same place in the same way as he went. Not, I point out, in the same way as he came the first time. Complete contrast to his first coming. If it was a star pointed out his first coming, it will be lightning from the eastern horizon to the western horizon. They will mark his second coming because again the sky will announce it. But that's a sharp contrast. When he came the first time, he came as a little baby. He's not coming back as a little baby. Though I was recently at a meeting where they asked me, um, would I like the, a song after I'd spoken? And I said, yes, I'm speaking on the second coming. All you need to do is find a song about the second coming. And my, did they have a problem finding one song about Jesus returning out of the hundreds of songs that are being written now, there's hardly any about the Lord's return. Isn't that astonishing? But they did find one. And in this song it says, we shall welcome him again as a little baby in a manger. And I thought, who on earth wrote that song? You know, some of the songs we get today are rubbish. They really are. And that certainly was a good example of that. Coming back as a little baby in a manger? No, he's coming back as a full-grown man. And all the world still celebrates Christmas and worships the little baby. They're going to get an awful shock when they meet him because he's not a baby anymore. He's coming back as the man, the Son of God. Well, now, if it's a contrast to his first coming, it's not a contrast to his first going. As he went, so he will return. And there's a direct correlation. He went in the clouds, carried up to heaven. He will come in the clouds, carried down to earth. And uh, we shall see that. That means again that there will be a west wind on that day, bringing clouds from the Mediterranean. It's going to be a very noisy day, by the way. If you don't like noisy meetings, don't come. There'll be trumpets blasting, there'll be angels shouting. I tell you, and I won't be silent either. I've told you that if I die before he comes back, 
I don't lose anything, I gain something. I get a, a front seat at the big meeting because the dead in Christ rise first. So I'll see you at the big meeting. And what a meeting that's going to be. Too big to hold in a stadium, so they're going to hold it up in the air. And there'll be room for all of us there. But what a meeting that's going to be. There are three Greek words that are used in our New Testament to describe the return of Jesus. The first is parousia. In English spelling P-A-R-O-U-S-I-A. -A, parousia. And that's got a very special meaning. It means to arrive to arrive. But it's a word that is usually kept for a royal arrival. I was watching the news last night and our Queen has visited Ireland for the first time. And there's been an awful lot of security questions about that, but she's gone. And she's been accepted very warmly. When she arrived at the airport, that's a parousia. But it's got one or two other special undertones. It is the arrival of a royal person to visit a city. But the royal person will be met outside the city and then accompanied in procession into the city. And that's what happened to the queen in Ireland. She was met at the airport by the dignitaries and the important people, and then a procession of cars led her into the city. That's a parousia. To let a royal person arrive at a city un unaccompanied would be an insult. So they're always met outside the city and then accompanied into the city and then the general public can see them. And it's very interesting that it's called a parousia when Jesus returns. We meet him in the air to accompany him to earth when the public will be aware that he's back. That's a parousia. And it's a very important point when we meet the Lord in the air, when we are caught up in what people call the rapture, we don't then go up to heaven, we come back to earth with him. We accompany him on the last part of his journey. That's parousia. The next Greek word that is used is epiphania. Epiphania. If the first word means to arrive, the second word means to appear to appear publicly, where the crowds can see, where the public can know. Now, our royal family lives in Buckingham Palace. Sorry, you say Buckingham Palace. <laughs> and uh, there's a big balcony on the front of the building. And after any royal occasion, like the royal wedding, for example, everybody expects the royal family to appear publicly on the balcony where everybody can see them. That's an epiphania. And usually there's the wide road in front of Buckingham Palace called the Mall is packed as far as the eye can see with people waiting for the appearance of the royal family on the balcony. That's an epiphania. And that's a word that's used of Jesus' return as well. And a third Greek word is the word apocalypsis. And essentially that Greek word means an unveiling, an appearance in glory, everything now visible that was not visible before. It's virtually a royal person with a crown and robes. It's an unveiling of the person as who they really are. One of the old fairy tales I remember as a little boy, I think probably by one of the brothers Grimm, 
You've heard of Grimm's fairy tales, no doubt. And it was about an emperor who came a day before he was due to come and came dressed as a beggar and went through the streets of the town as a beggar to see how people would treat him. <laughs> the next day he came as the emperor in his carriage and the people recognized the face and realized he was the beggar on the day before. It's, it's a lovely fairy tale. And it's so true of Jesus. He came the first time humble. Only three people saw him in his glory, and that was Peter, James, and John. Nobody else did. And when they saw him in glory, it says the light was shining through his clothes making him appear so bright and his clothes so clean. You can imagine a strong light inside cloth. It just lights up the cloth. They saw him in his glory and his glory shone through his clothes. But that was only one little glimpse and nobody else ever saw him like that until perhaps Saul on the road to Damascus. And when he saw Jesus then, he was seeing Jesus who had returned to his glory and it blinded Saul and he couldn't see a thing from that moment. But when Jesus gets back, there will be an apocalypsis, an unveiling of his glory and the world will see him as he really is in all his glory as the Son of God. So those are three very interesting Greek words about how he will come back. A parousia, a royal visitor being met outside the city by his important people and accompanied by them right the way down to earth. And the second word was epiphania. He will appear publicly to the people and all will know he's back. And above all, an apocalypsis. They will see him in all his glory. Well, now that's answered three questions. Who is coming back? How is he coming back? Sorry, only two questions. No, what was the other one? Where is he coming back? That's right. But none of those questions is terribly important. The one question everybody wants to ask is, when is he coming back? I told you earlier in the week that people have been trying to guess that date for so long. Martin Luther said it would be 636. How he reached that date, I don't know. John Wesley tried to guess and guessed 1874. And I told you those two men were wise choosing a date well beyond their lifetime and then they would never have to apologize to anybody and never eat humble pie for getting it wrong. And then we get people like Russell of the Jehovah's Witnesses who said it would be 1914. You got, you got Miller of the Seventh-day Adventists saying it would be 1843. People have tried and tried. The latest one I heard was 1996 and someone sent me a whole thick book proving that he'd be back then. He hasn't been in touch with me since for some reason, but never mind. Is he going to come at any moment? Is his coming imminent? Could it be today? Could it be tonight? And I've heard parents doing what I think is a wicked thing telling their children, you better decide for Jesus today because you might wake up in the morning and your parents will be gone. I think that's a horrid way to talk to children and quite unlike Jesus. Jesus said, watch and pray. What did he mean by watch? And the answer is, he meant us to watch for signs. Those who don't watch and pray will be completely caught out. It will be a shock to them. 
They will be like the people in Noah's day, eating, drinking, marrying. And suddenly he's there. And he will come to them totally unexpectedly, like a thief in the night. And they will find themselves facing loss. But the New Testament is quite clear that alert believers will never be surprised. They will be like the householder who knew a thief was coming in the night and who stayed awake and watched for the first signs of the thief coming. And so were ready. And that is why Jesus specifically gave us signs, signals of what would happen before he gets here. And so believers who are alert and praying will not be surprised. They will know as the events unfold that they were getting nearer and nearer to the time when he appeared. Now I did talk about this last week, Friday and Saturday. Forgive me if I repeat a few things because we're on the same subject of the end times. When the disciples asked Jesus a straight question, he gave them a straight answer. And uh, we have that answer in Matthew 24. They said, what will be the signs or the signals of your coming? And he gave them four. And I, I thought that this morning I'd run through them in detail so that you've got them clear. And of those four signs, one and a half are clearly there in our world, which leaves two and a half to go. So we're not right at the end yet, no. The two and a half could happen quite quickly with the speed of world events, or they could take another 50 or 100 years. Nobody knows. But when the third and fourth signs come, we shall know that we're getting very near. Let me run through the four signs that he gave his disciples. This is a broad outline. You will find in the middle chapters of Revelation a much more detailed program of these four events. So you can take your pick. Matthew 24 gives an overview of the signs, and then Revelation gives us the detailed view. But I'm just going to give you the overview this morning, because that'll give you a general idea of what to look for. The signs are located, the first sign is in the world, the second sign is in the church, the third sign is in the Middle East, and the fourth sign is in the sky. So you not only know what to look for, but you know where to look. And Jesus is giving us every help he can to be ready for the big event. The first sign is in the world and consists of general disasters. And Jesus listed three, wars, famines, and earthquakes. And we've got all three in our world right now. We've had them for some time. I used to think that earthquakes were increasing, but they're not. What is happening is that far more people are being killed by earthquakes than ever before. Partly because we have an increased population and partly because people are living in the most dangerous earthquake areas in the world. And they seem willing to build houses there and hope that it won't happen in their lifetime, and then it does. Earthquakes are happening now in places they haven't happened in for a long time. So there's been an increase in that way. One was in the center of India where they've never had an earthquake which did a huge amount of damage. And uh, one building in which the youth of the mission were meeting in an upper floor completely collapsed, but the floor on which the youth of the mission workers were was still all right, but it was just lower. 
and uh, they were saved and all kinds of stories circulate about earthquakes. But earthquakes are not caused by man. They are natural disasters. And I've got a little book on the bookstall here, but I noticed that only two are left. Why does God allow natural disasters? Wars, however, are caused by human beings. And so are famines. I was interviewed on Australian uh, radio, ABC, and the very uh, hostile interviewer said, I've just been in Ethiopia and I saw millions starving. How can you believe in a good God who lets that happen? His name was Daryl Hinch. And I said, Mr. Hinch, did you know that there is enough food in the world for everybody to have enough. And the United Nations Food Organization has reported every year there is enough food in the world for everybody. It's not God's fault that people are starving. It's that some of us live in countries where obesity is a problem and we're eating far too much and others live in a country where they don't have enough food. It's not God. God has every year supplied enough food for the whole world. It's we who don't share it out. And we throw away food in our Western society that the third world would be jolly glad to eat. So don't ever blame God for famines. He is not at fault. He promised to do his part by maintaining summer and winter, springtime and harvest, and he has kept his promise. It is we who've let him down and keep too much food for part of the world instead of sharing it out. So wars and famines are caused by human beings, but earthquakes are not. And uh, get my little book on natural disasters for an explanation of why God allows those. When the world is being shaken up with disasters, Jesus then gives a warning of deception. When each of these four signs comes, Jesus said, don't be deceived. And the deception, when the world is shaken by disasters, will be false messiahs. There will be people who will seize on people's insecurity and claim claims for themselves that are false. And people will go after people who are going, giving false promises of security in a shaking age. And we have seen that. You've had a few here in America. And when false messiahs set up, people in their insecurity will follow them. It usually ends in disaster, but nevertheless, it's a feature of our world. And Jesus' counsel is, when the world is shaking with war, famine, earthquake, don't panic. Don't be alarmed. Don't be disturbed as other people are disturbed. Don't let your heart be troubled. He says, these are painful, but they're the pains of birth not the pains of death. They're the pains of a new beginning. Just as a woman is experiencing pain before the baby is born, the world is going to experience more pain before the new world is born. So when you read these disasters in the newspapers, don't say this is the end, say it's the beginning. These are the pains of birth not the pains of death. That should mean that you remain stable when your neighbors are shaken. It should mean that. But sometimes Christians get shaken and Jesus said, don't. Don't panic. Don't be troubled. And that's sign number one. Sign number two is in the church. 
And just as he gave three things for the sign in the world, he gives three things for the signs in the church. The first sign is opposition. You will be hated in every nation. Now that has never been true and it's not true now, but it's coming true. The world hates the church in many, many nations. You are privileged to be in a nation where Christians are not hated. They may be a bit disliked, but they're not hated. And Jesus predicts in the second sign, universal hatred of Christians. That will lead, of course, to persecution. Now, the majority of Christians in the world are living in nations that are making life difficult for them. It's building up very steadily. I never thought I'd live in an England where Christians were under pressure, but I do now. They're not just being laughed at and mocked on the media. For the first time in my lifetime, English people have been arrested for preaching in the open air. That has never happened before in my lifetime. They are being accused of disturbing the peace. And with the new laws on what you say, we're losing freedom of speech. And when that goes, Christians will be a prime target. So Jesus said there'll be opposition to the church in every nation. Secondly, he said, that will lead to a great reduction in the size of a church, of the church worldwide. He said the love of many will grow cold and they will leave. The, in fact, he didn't say that, the love of many. He said the love of most will grow cold. The church will experience a great reduction in size. You know, in the days, uh, some decades ago, when Christians in Russia were under great pressure, there was a group of Christians meeting secretly in a home to pray. And suddenly in the middle of the meeting, two Russian soldiers with Kalashnikov rifles burst into the prayer meeting and said, we've come to kill you. And the Christians looked up in alarm. And then the Russian soldiers said, if you're not a Christian, get out. And the number got up and ran. And then the two soldiers said to those who remained, now can you tell us how to become Christians, please? but we had to make sure of you first. Boy, what would happen to the prayer room here if people had burst in with guns? We don't know. But uh, there was a reduction in that prayer meeting. And the true Christians stayed. And Jesus said, that's going to happen. The love of most will grow cold. Sunday Christians will be out the door like a shot. And then, if you think that's negative, he then said, and, not but, and the gospel will be preached to every ethnic group. Now, there's a logic that is illogical to us, but logical to God. A church under persecution that loses people will then be able to get on with the job of evangelism because it's been purified. Do you know how many church members in America it takes to win one person for Christ in a year? The answer according to the statistics is 33. At the moment it takes 33 church members to get one more in a year. That's not real growth, is it? And in England, it's even more startling. 
But here is Jesus saying, once persecution comes and the numbers fall off, the rest will be able to do the job and they'll get on with it and the gospel will be preached to all ethnic groups and then the end will come. And I can prove that to you. Everywhere in the world the church is being persecuted, it's growing. It seems as if persecution purifies the church and then increases it. It's an amazing story. The church is not being wiped out by persecution. It almost seems as if persecution makes it grow. And so Jesus said, don't get deceived. But in the second sign, he said, don't be deceived by false prophets. In the world there will be false messiahs and people in the world will follow them, but Christians don't. We know that Jesus is the Messiah and we stay with him. But in times of pressure, false prophets within the church can get a following among Christians. And Jesus warned us, don't listen to false prophets when all this is happening to the church. From our Bible, we know what false prophets are. They prophesy peace when there is no peace. They say everything's going to be all right, don't worry. They preach calm and collectedness when the church is in serious difficulty. So you can tell a false prophet they comfort when they should be challenging. And Jesus said, beware of false prophets when you see these things in the church. And his advice is endure. Stick it out and evangelize while you endure. Preach the gospel, even to those who persecute you, but endure. And it's in there that he said, he who endures to the end will be saved. So each time when he gives a sign, tells us what it is, he then says, this is how you might be deceived and this is my advice. It's a very clear pattern. So we turn to the third sign that he gave and this becomes more specific and it hasn't happened yet and that is desecration in the Middle East in Jerusalem itself. And here Jesus quoted the book of Daniel from the Old Testament and reminded his hearers that Daniel talked about a horrible event called the abomination of desolation in the temple in Jerusalem. Actually, Daniel's prophecy came true already but will come true again just before Jesus return. It came true with a man called um, no, sorry, Alexander forgotten his second name. Sorry? Epiphanes. There's the word again, glorious and appearing. Um, Alexander Epiphanes, right? Sorry? Okay, did you all hear that? <laughs> well, he came to Jerusalem about 160 years before Jesus and he did terrible things in Jerusalem. He went to the temple and uh, he sacrificed pigs on the altar of God knowing that they were unclean animals. And he filled the temple rooms with prostitutes and he degraded the whole situation but fortunately only for three and a half years and then he was gone. That was an abomination of desolation and Jesus said the same thing will happen again towards the end of the world. He's referring to the Antichrist who will in Jerusalem commit the ultimate desecration and claim himself to be God. And uh, that hasn't happened yet, but it will. 
he will be a man of utter blasphemy, a man of terrible cruelty. And Jesus said he will cause distress such as the world has never seen before. And that will be a terrible but fortunately brief time. It's here that Jesus says, unless it was kept short, no one would survive. And he then gives a warning again of deception. And this time he says there will be false messiahs and false prophets. It's going to be a time when many people will be deceived. And we must listen to Jesus' advice. And Jesus' advice is this. Don't move unless you're somewhere near Jerusalem and then you should get out as quickly as you can. But he said, the rest of you, don't be moved. Don't listen to Romans. Don't let your ears lead you astray. Use your eyes and watch for these signs. And then he quoted a proverb where the now where the body is the vultures will gather and that's a reference to the false prophets and false messiahs who come to eat the body of Christ if they can then we come to the fourth sign and this sign is unmistakable all the lights in the sky will be switched off. The sun, the moon, the stars, the world will be left in total darkness. Who could mistake that sign? It's a preparation for the lightning from the east to the west that will mark Jesus' arrival. But all the natural light in the universe, just as when Jesus died, the sun went out, when he's coming back, the sun, moon, and stars will all go out and leave us in darkness, waiting for the light to come. And lightning from west to east will light the whole sky up. And when you see that, said Jesus, when you see all these things, you know that he is at the door, just about to step through and back onto the stage of history. Well, when I was a boy, I remember being taken to the theater for the first time. Uh, I forget what the play was. It may have been what we call a pantomime at Christmas, but I remember sitting there as a little boy and one by one the house lights went down until we were sitting in utter darkness. But my little heart was pounding. I was waiting for something to happen. And then the curtains parted. The unveiling happened. And there was a brilliantly lit stage full of people singing. What an exciting moment that was. And ever since, I've thought that's how it's going to be when Jesus gets back. The whole universe, all the house lights switched off. And we're waiting in the darkness for something to happen. And then the unveiling. And Jesus in his glory lights the whole world up. <laughs> Hallelujah. What an amazing event. Well, what was his talk about deception when the lights go out? Nothing at all. It'll happen too quickly. <laughs> Nobody will deceive us then. We shall be absolutely convinced. He's about to appear. So what was his advice? None. He just said, look up and wait and he'll be there. Now, I've taken some time about those signs because that's what we're going to see before he comes. And he said, when you see all these things, you know that he is at the door. And it's only when you see them all that you will know that. And we haven't seen the whole church hated by every nation yet, so we haven't even got all the second sign yet. We certainly haven't seen the abomination of desolation in Jerusalem. And we certainly haven't seen a sky that's completely dark, and though it's pretty dim this morning, <laughs> And that thunder's telling us so, but still we can go out and see each other. 
there's still a natural light up there but one day there won't even be any light up there and we will know and our hearts will pound with excitement he's here at last and we've waited for so long well now that's my message about the second coming but my biggest question is why is he coming back and that's the question that people don't ask I wish they did I think they're just looking forward to seeing him face to face but why should he come back to earth what didn't he do the first time that he's got to come back to do and above all why is he emptying heaven when he comes back because he's bringing all the people who've died in Christ with him says that so all the saints who've died including my daughter my sister her husband my mother-in-law they're all with Christ now and he's bringing them all back here why is he coming back and why is he bringing all them back and if I'm gone before he gets back he'll be bringing me back why Lord I want to stay in heaven <laughs> why are you bringing me back to earth and here I sadly have to tell you that there's a huge division huge division among Christians in the world as to why he's coming back the Apostles Creed which I'm following has got it wrong it says he's coming back to judge the quick and the dead meaning the living and the dead and I believe he will judge the living and dead that's my next subject in the second session I don't believe he's coming back to do that because that will not take place on the earth so he's not coming back to the earth to do that why then is he coming back and bringing all the saints in heaven with him that's a huge logistic thing to do why does he need them all back here and this is the big division between professing Christians around the world one group says he's coming back to judge which doesn't fit the scripture the other group in which I count myself and I hope most of you is that he's coming back to reign to rule to take over the world until the nations of the world become the nation the people of our God and his Messiah and that's what I firmly believe if you ask another question not only why is he coming back but how long will he stay here on the second visit some Christians seem to think it'll only be two minutes and then we're all off again so why empty heaven <laughs> bring them all here and then take them straight back up again would seem a bit of a waste of time and energy no I believe he's coming back to rule to reign and for the first time this world will have a Christian government and he needs those saints to help him to take the world over and he will take the throne of the world and his saints will reign with him and Israel will reign with him because by that time they will be saved too and so saints will take over the world this part of me dreads that because we can't even run the church properly now and we're going to run the world we must get into practice we're going to rule the nations Paul said it we must be ready to judge each other because we're going to judge the nations and our future destiny is to be the Christian government of the world Jesus said when I get back I want to be able to say well done good and faithful servant enter into the joy of your Lord I'm going to put you in charge of ten cities and he meant that quite literally we are going to take the world over 
we'll be governing the banks, we'll be controlling the media. Can you imagine it? Not as we are. <laughs> He'd better do a lot more for us to get us ready for that. But it's all there in Scripture. And so I believe he's coming back to rule and to reign. I'm going to read a hymn to you, a song that was my favorite hymn when I was a boy. Perhaps because it was a very catchy tune. But something in the song captured my little boy's heart before I knew Christ. And I loved to sing this hymn in church because there was something special about it. Some of you may know the hymn. Sing with the King who is coming to reign. Glory to Jesus, the Lamb that was slain. Life and salvation his empire shall bring. Joy to the nations when Jesus is King. All men shall dwell in his marvelous light. Races long severed his love shall unite. Justice and truth from his scepter shall spring. Wrong shall be ended when Jesus is king. All shall be well in his kingdom of peace. Freedom shall flourish and wisdom increase. Foe shall be friend when his triumph we sing. Sword shall be sickle when Jesus is king. Souls shall be saved from the burden of sin. Doubt shall not darken his witness within. Hell hath no terrors and death has no sting. Love is victorious when Jesus is king. Kingdom of Christ for your coming we pray. Hasten, O Father, the dawn of the day. When this new song thy creation shall sing, Satan is vanquished and Jesus is king. Let me finish by showing you something. I was in New York in between planes for about six hours and so I got hold of a yellow taxi and said, take me around New York, but particularly, I want to go and visit the United Nations, not far from the Brooklyn Bridge. And uh, I'd heard about this magnificent building in which the United Nations meet, and I knew it was open to visitors, so I, the taxi dropped me outside and there, outside the main entrance, was a block of granite, great stone, with half a verse of scripture on it. It's a bit dangerous only to put half the verse, as I'll show you, but there it was. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. It's in Isaiah, but it's only half the verse. And then a little girl in blue uniform showed us round the United Nations, the General Assembly room, the Security Council room, the committee rooms, and all the rooms were decorated with works of art from the whole world. It's a magnificent building. And then after two hours, the little girl in blue uniform said, well, ladies and gentlemen, that completes our tour. Have a nice day. <laughs> and I said, but you haven't shown us one room. And she said, what room is that? And I told her, oh, she said, that's closed. It's locked up. The public isn't allowed in that room. I said, but I, I've come to the United Nations to see that room. I've been told about it and I want to see it. She said, well, I'm sorry, it's locked up, you can't see it. I said, I've come all the way from little old England to see that room. That really seems to appeal to American hearts somehow. <laughs> and she began to soften a bit. And she said, well, go down to the lobby and get one of the guards and ask him if he'll show you the room. So I went down 
to the lobby and here was a man six foot ten I think he looked it with a couple of pistols in his belt and I said um, the guide told me I should ask you to show me this room oh no he said that's closed to the public and I said but I've come all the way from little old England to see this room and he said well how long would you be in there I said two minutes I've just heard about it I just want to see whether what I've heard is true and he said all right and he took a key off a hook and he took me across the lobby to a little door at one side of the lobby and he showed me into the room and I saw the God of the United Nations the God they pray to for world peace when that United Nations building was first built the first general secretary said we have no prayer room and so they built an extra room on between two of the wings it has no windows but it's a wedge-shaped room squeezed in and they had a prayer room and then the big debate began what to put in it and uh, some wanted a cross, others didn't want a cross. The Hindus wanted flowers, the Muslims didn't want flowers. And they had a huge debate. And finally they approached a sculptor. And they said, would you fashion with your skillful hands something that would represent all the gods of the world that we can put in the prayer room? And he went away and he made a simple black block painted in a matte black paint so you can't see any reflections from it. it your eye goes right into it and he presented this to the United Nations and said anybody can go in and kneel down to this and imagine their own God in there so it represents all the God of gods of the world it has no shape so it it can represent them all and then they put stools and prayer mats around it now I'd heard this and I thought surely it's not true but I've seen it and if you don't believe me I'll show you the photograph of it afterwards that's the big black block that they pray to for peace in the world. I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. I'm not sure which I did it. Praying to that for world peace. Actually, the United Nations building has been built in the wrong place, the wrong city. And that text on the outside block of granite will never come true because of that the first half of the verse says when the Lord reigns in Zion he will settle the disputes among the nations and they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks and you can't miss out that first half of the verse and I believe that one day the Lord will reign in Zion in Jerusalem and that's where the United Nations will be. And then, then there will be multilateral disarmament and all the money we're spending on guns and bombs and mines will be spent to feed the hungry and clothe them. That's not a dream. God has promised it. And I am... 150% sure it's going to happen. Praise be to his name. Amen.